This is a University of Otago podcast. Kia ora koutou. Tēnā koe, Sally. I'm Vernon Squire. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic and I'm representing the Vice-Chancellor tonight. Unfortunately, Harleen Hain is in Wellington and can't be here. And uh, told me before she left that she very much regretted that and uh, to apologise personally to, to Sally. So welcome everyone, <coughs> excuse me, to Professor Sally McCormack's uh, inaugural professorial lecture. And a very, very special welcome to Sally's family, her mum and dad, Heather and Kevin, her two children, Todd and Kelly, her two brothers, Simon and Niven, and their wives, Nicola and Sandra, three nieces, Rachel, Lauren, and Anna, <laughs> and Sally's partner, Neil. Welcome. These events are very special to me personally, as they represent one of the few occasions where I'm reminded what this university is all, is all about. It's about first-rate research, it's about outstanding teachers, and of course it's about our students. Contrary to what my job normally involves, it is not about budget committees writing and actioning strategic plans and externally imposed bureaucracy. It's more about the opportunity to hear from a top scholar about her successes in her chosen field, in this case, biochemistry. Now, getting to be a full professor here is as challenging, if not more challenging, as any university in the world, including the highest ranked ones. But unlike many, we measure all aspects of the job. Being the chair of the Staffing Advisory Committee and usually, in fact always, sitting on professorial appointment committees allows me to say that with some confidence. Applicants for professor must demonstrate sustained outstanding leadership and competence in two out of the three areas of teaching, research, and service. And they must demonstrate sustained outstanding competence in the third area. In Sally's case, she has shown distinction in teaching evaluations, where she sits consistently in the excellence range. She has won the OSMS Distinguished Academic Teacher Award. But she's also shown a considerable history of innovation in course development underpinned by a strong commitment to research-informed, case-based teaching using real-life examples. Sally has been primary supervisor of 11 PhD students, 10 master's students, and 16 honours students. Likewise, Sally's service has been of the highest standard possible both in regard to her professional commitments through conference organisation, outreach and public lectures, but also her long-standing <coughs> work in the B-Biomed Sci undergraduate and postgraduate programmes. She served as Deputy Head of the Biochemistry Department as well. A major output of research papers in high quality journals with significant professional uptake has produced an impressive H index, which is a measure of research productivity. While Sally's capacity to bring in significant revenue to support her research, well over $3 million, has always been welcomed by the university. Please continue, Sally. <laughs> These cred credentials reflect a level of scholarship that provoked strong comments from a field of international referees during the application process to, to become a professor. I quote, Dr. McCormack, McCormack is an internationally recognised authority. 
She is recognised for her pioneering work and possibly most tellingly, one of her PhD students presented one of the best PhD theses that I've ever read. A personal congratulations from me, Sally, for this exceptional performance. I would li now like to introduce Professor Vernon Ward, the Dean of OSMS, who will give a brief biographical account of Sally before she starts her lecture. Vernon. Thank you. Welcome everybody, it's great to see you all here this evening and um, I'm really delighted to have the pleasure of giving a brief biological sketch of uh, Professor Sally McCormick as she does her inaugural professorial lecture today. Um, so I have the privilege of giving just a little bit of background there, I won't embarrass Sally too much, I threatened I would but I won't. And. Um, Basically, for those of you who don't know, she started her academic uh, career with a Bachelor of Agricultural Science with Honours from Lincoln College. She then went on to do a PhD um, through Lincoln University, but it was based at the Christchurch School of Medicine, as it was known at the time. And her uh, thesis title was Hyperbeta Lipoproteinemia and Truncated Forms of Human Apolipoprotein B. She will tell you what that means. I won't. But the, I think the, the real message here is right from an early stage of her, of her academic career, it was very clear she knew what she wanted to work on and why she wanted to work on it, and I think that shows through. So it's still, still there, those lipids. So after attaining her PhD, she went to the Gladstone Institute of Cardiovascular um, Disease in San Francisco. She started there as a postdoctoral fellow and moved on become, to become a senior um, research scientist there. She then returned to, um, to New Zealand and picked up the lectureship here at Otago in biochemistry and where she's continued through and worked her way through the ranks of the senior lectureship, associate professor and now professor um, within the department and within the School of Medical Sciences and these are very richly deserved. Her research focus is the regulation of molecules involved in heart disease with a particular interest in plasma lipoproteins that determine blood cholesterol levels. And so that's the sort of topic and the theme that she's going to present to you this evening. Now I'm not going to talk about that because we'll leave her to present to you what it is that she's going to talk about. And I guess I would just like to reiterate a few of the things that Professor Vernon Squire commented on about the, the, the sort of three pillars, if you will, of an academic career, your service, your research and your teaching. And those were highlighted, but I'd also like to bring out the collaborations from around the world that Sally has, which recognise her skills and her knowledge and her base. You know, she's on HRC assessment panels, she's on a whole raft of different granting body panels, done assessment of grants. That whole service side of it really comes through strongly as well as her research, the awards she's picked up with teaching, um, nominated for Supervisor of the Year by the Otago University Students Association. The list goes on and on. And I think it's really impressive when you see somebody that's done quite that many things. So it's really, really well done. So it's a really broad and impressive academic career and I'm sure she'll give a wonderful lecture this evening. So it's with great pleasure that I asked Sally to present her inaugural professorial lecture entitled New Connections Between Oil Lipids. Thank you, Vernon and Vernon. Tēnā koutou. He ahurangi aho i mahi ana ki te tari matu ko ora. Ko wai karikari te awa, ko te wai hora te roto. I tipu a ki aho ki sejmia. Tata tonu ki te marae o nati moki. Norera, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Welcome everyone. Welcome family, friends, and colleagues, and groupies, <laughs> to my. Uh, professorial lecture. It's really good that you could be here tonight. I just want to mention a couple of very important people that are in the audience tonight. Firstly, my parents, Heather and Kevin. I'm just so grateful that you can be here tonight um, to share with me this event and to be here to support me. I also want to mention my two children, Todd and Kelly. Kelly actually marks my tenure here at Otago because she was born um, just before I came to Otago. And this is a picture of her and Todd here. Todd was about seven at the time. And this is them now. I don't know what happened. <laughs> they grew up, well, sort of. 
and um, I'm pleased that they're here to, to hear this tonight. So what I'm going to tell you about tonight is a tale of two lipoproteins. Um, these, these are the um, complexes of lipid and proteins which carry fats in our blood. So when you go to your GP and you get a lipid test and they're measuring your cholesterol and your triglyceride levels, they are actually measuring the lipids contained in these particles here, known as lipoproteins. And there's five different classes of lipoproteins, and I've spent the most part of 20 years um, researching two of them, one called lipoprotein little a and the other called HDL. And so I've had two major research programs going on while I've been here at Otago, one on lipoprotein little a and the other one on HDL, and these programs have been completely independent of each other. But just in the last two years, we've found a connection between these two um, different lipoproteins, and I'll talk about that at the end of my uh, lecture tonight. But first I want to tell you a little bit about my uh, lipoprotein A program, and then I'll talk a little bit about the HDL program, and then I'll talk about the connection that we've found. But firstly, just a little bit about myself, and Vernon has already touched on this. These were my marks uh, in my final year at Lincoln. Now, it looks like I'm a straight A student, but in actual fact, if you translate those marks into the Otago system, it's a B, an A minus, an A minus, and a B. Pretty mediocre, actually. And not a biochemistry degree. And not even a university. <laughs> so it can only get better from here. <laughs> so that was where I started. And so hopefully tonight I can tell you a little bit about how I came to be a professor in biochemistry. There was a little bit of biochemistry in here. In fact, my honours dissertation was very biochemical. It was on haemoglobin variants associated with anemia. And it was during my honours project that I learnt that I was really interested in research, but also that I grew a love of blood proteins. So proteins in the blood, and particularly those that were involved in disease. And this continued um, on, and I did my PhD project actually in the same lab uh, at the Christchurch School of Medicine with uh, Dr Peter George. And here I studied a man that had a really low cholesterol level, and turned out that he had a truncated or short form of a very important protein called ApoB, which uh, is uh, a protein that carries cholesterol in the blood. So while I was doing my PhD, I came in contact with this man here, Dr. Stephen Young, who had just set up a very successful lipid metabolism lab at the Gladstone Institute in San Francisco. And I started communicating with him while I was doing um, my PhD and ended up that I went to his lab in San Francisco to do my postdoc. So I went there in 1993 um, and was with Steve for three and a half years. Steve was an absolutely fantastic mentor. He taught me many, many things. I think the two main things he taught me was, one, always be thinking about the next experiment, and two, write well. And he was a fabulous writer. He's published over 300 papers. Scientific papers are fairly boring. They're full of scientific jargon. They're very repetitive. But Steve used to write papers like a novel. And I'll always be indebted to him for teaching me how to write. Uh, Steve has actually just been inducted into the National Academy of Sciences in the US, which is one of the highest accolades that a scientist can gain. So he's a very famous man, and I'm just very lucky that I went to his lab to do my postdoc. While I was in his lab, I developed an interest in this molecule here, known as lipoprotein little a. Now, most of you won't have heard of lipoprotein little a, but you will have heard of LDL, or low-density lipoprotein, otherwise known as the bad cholesterol. LDL is the one that gets stuck in your arteries, accumulates, causes uh, an accumulation of lipid or fats in your arteries and ultimately um, is, a, is a very important risk factor for developing heart disease. LP little a is kind of like LDL's cousin because it's very highly related. The only difference is that it has an extra protein stuck to it and that protein is known as apo little a. 
APO little a is thought to have evolved from plasminogen, which is a protein involved in the breakdown of blood clots. Now, this is what LP little a looks like under the microscope. It's just a blob with a bit of a shadowy bit around the outside. This is the artist's impression. I prefer this one. We'll stick with this one for the talk. Much prettier. So what was known about lipoprotein little a, or what is known about lipoprotein little a, is that it's a very important risk factor for developing heart disease. It was first discovered in 1963, and I was very, very fortunate, fortunate in 2002 to actually meet the man that discovered lipoprotein little a, a Norwegian physician by the name of Kerr Berg, who discovered LPLA in 1963. This is his original paper. And at the time, no one really thought much about it. They just thought, oh, it's a variant of LDL. It's probably not going to amount to much. And so not much was, was done on LPLA for a long time. But over the years, what has accumulated in the literature is that very large clinical studies have shown that elevated levels of lipoprotein little a are a very important risk factor for heart disease. If you have elevated levels, you're at twofold risk of developing heart disease. If you have extremely high levels, you're more likely four or five times to be at risk of developing a heart attack. We also know that it's present in atherosclerotic tissues, so biopsies taken from people that have died of heart attacks, when they look at their arteries, they see that LP layers accumulated in the arteries. And also there's been studies on uh, transgenic mice and rabbits who don't normally have lipoprotein little a, but who can be engineered to um, carry LP little a in their blood, and they develop atherosclerosis. What is missing from the lipoprotein little a field is an intervention trial. And what I mean by intervention trial is that where you take a drug or a therapy that will lower a risk factor, and you see that it lowers the rates of heart attacks. And that is missing from the LPLA field. And the reason why I think it's missing is that we don't know enough about the lipoprotein little a molecule. And when I came to Otago in 1996, there were three major questions about lipoprotein little a that that hadn't been answered, and so I set about, um, with my research program, trying to answer some of these questions. The first question was, how is it assembled? What we did know was that there was a disulfide link, a cross-link between the APO little a protein and the APO B protein, which is the major protein sitting on the LDL molecule, but we didn't know much about how these proteins came to be together. We didn't know anything about LPLA function. And there are, a lot of people don't actually have LPLA in their blood. About 10% of people actually don't have LPLA, but some of you won't have any LPLA. And those people that don't have it are perfect, seem to be perfectly fine. So the question is, well, why do we have it? What's its role? We knew a lot about how it was involved in heart disease, but we didn't know what its actual function was. So that was another question that I hoped to get some information on. The third question was, how is it catabolized? And what I mean by that is, how is it taken up by cells? How is it cleared from the blood? And so that was another question that uh, we wanted to answer. So starting with the first question, the first um, project that I did at Otago was trying to understand how LP little a was assembled. So LDL is actually derived from VLDL, which is a much, much bigger lipoprotein. I couldn't fit VLDL on a slide because it would block out the whole slide. So it's a big particle, and it gets secreted by the liver, and it gets converted to LDL in the bloodstream, in circulation, by a series of enzymes that um, basically metabolise it, its lipids to make it a smaller particle. And the APOA component, this component here, it also gets secreted by the liver in, in the free form. And somehow, the LDL and the APOA magically find each other in circulation. And that's quite a big ask, because there's lots of things floating around in our blood, lots of proteins, um, including lots of proteins with uh, free cysteines, which could cross-link to each other. So it was thought that there must be something special that brings these two things together before we get this cross-link formed. 
And so I proposed a two-step model for LP little a assembly, shown here, where the cross-link was actually the second step in a two-step model, and the first step was some kind of uh, non-covalent association between these two proteins, the APOA protein and the APOB protein on the surface of LEL, that actually got these two proteins together in the first place for the two cysteines to be able to form a crosslink. And during my postdoc um, years, I had managed to produce a number of mutant, for, mutant forms of APOB, including two that were truncated forms, uh, an APOB97 and an APOB95. And what I'd shown with these two different short versions of the APOB protein was that the B97 formed LPLA very well, as good as the full length APOB, but the B95 didn't form uh, LPLA very well at all. So that got us uh, thinking about the sequences between 95 and 97 because we thought there must be something in here that's important for getting these two proteins together. And uh, I had a um, in fact, my very first PhD student, Catherine Liu, did some studies uh, on some of these mutants, and she found a sequence that was in, in the 95 to 97 region that was rich in lysines, and we were excited about that because we thought lysine residues might be involved because the APOA protein has lysine binding domains uh, and contained in its structure. And so we thought, well, it's probably binding to lysines on APOB. So we had a sequence here, it was about 21 amino acids. And what my very first PhD student, Catherine, did was she mutated those lysine residues. And what she showed with this mutant APOB was that it didn't form LPLA very well at all. And to further confirm that these sequences were important, we took this approach here where we actually synthesized a peptide, which is a short protein sequence, to that sequence, and we asked the questions, well, would this peptide bind to APOA, because we thought it should if it's important, and then in doing so, it might well keep the APOA protein away from LDL and actually prevent LPLA from ever forming. And so I had a, another PhD student, Rebecca Sharp, actually looked uh, to see if this was correct, and so we had a uh, assay that we do in the lab, which is what we call our LP little a formation assay, where we simply take APOA uh, in a test tube and we add LDL. And what we see then is we get LP little a formed, which is a much bigger particle, so it migrates uh, much more slowly on a gel system. And so we could get LPLA formed, and when we add it in our peptide, we saw with increasing amounts of the peptide that in fact we started to inhibit LP little a formation. <coughs> and Rebecca went on to develop a whole series of these peptides, including some that were more effective than this one, that inhibited LP little a formation in the nanomolar range. And then we had a really dumb idea. You, see, you, you occasionally have dumb ideas. And what, I got quite excited about this, and I thought, well, well we can block LP little a formation. We can develop a peptide drug that's going to block LPLA formation and lower LPLA LA, and we'll be famous. <coughs> Unfortunately, that was not the case. So we did move into animal studies with our most effective peptides, but it turned out that the peptides, when we delivered them into the circulation of animals, had very short half-lives, so they didn't last very long in the blood, and, they tended, and that was because they tended to aggregate. And so we pretty much drew a bit of a blank going into uh, moving into animal studies. That happens sometimes. But I had a colleague actually say to me around the time that this happened, he said to me, well, how do you know that this such situation is better than this situation? And he was right, because there were some studies coming out in the literature that actually showed that APOA alone, just the protein part alone, had some atherogenic properties. So maybe inhibiting LPLA was not such a good idea. Moving on. So the second question that we wanted to um, answer about LPLA was, what's its function? What does it do? Why do we have it? 
We did know a lot about how LPLA is involved in developing heart disease. We knew that the LDL part was atherogenic, it gets stuck in the arterial wall. We also knew that the APOA protein interferes with the breakdown of blood clots. So that is also um, a bad thing from a, from a heart um, point of view. But we didn't know its function. And so about 10 years ago, there were some studies starting to appear in the literature on uh, the proteomics of plasma lipoproteins. Now, proteomics is just a fancy word for protein makeup or what proteins are on something. And there'd been a couple of papers on LDL and there'd been a, a paper come out on HDL and we thought to ourselves, why don't we apply proteomics to look at what, what proteins are on the alkylal A particle? Because maybe that will give us a hint about what it does. So um, in my lab, we had developed a protocol for purifying the alkylal A particle from blood. And using that, uh, and combined with the expertise of Anna von Zinsky, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, and in conjunction with Torsten Kloffman, who runs the Centre for Protein Research uh, in our department, we took some isolated LPLA and we looked to identify all of the proteins that were contained on the particle. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking that there's only two proteins on LPLA because there's only two proteins shown here, apoL A and apoB, but in actual fact, there's a whole lot of proteins bound to this particle. And what Anna and Torsten found was a whole lot of proteins, about 35 different proteins. Some of these we expected to be there because we knew that some of the proteins would be the same proteins that they'd found in the LDL proteomic studies. And most of these are apoprotein proteins which bind lipids and we expected them to be there. But we also found some other unique proteins which we weren't expecting. We found various forms of uh, fibrinogen, which is the protein involved in blood clots, forming blood clots. We found a whole lot of proteins involved in the immune response. And what Anna did was she took all of these proteins and put them into a computer program that groups the proteins into their functional role. And when she did that, we came up with two major functional groups of proteins on the alpha little a particle. One group was the proteins involved in lipid transport, which we fully expected to be there because we knew that they were on the LDL part of the molecule. But there was an even bigger group which clustered into a group of proteins known as proteins involved in response to wounding. And these were proteins involved in the immune response and in the coagulation and the form formation of blood clots. You all know that when you wound yourself, what happens is there's an immune response, white blood cells come in to heal the uh, wound, and you have blood clots forming. And so if you were to predict, just based on the protein makeup of the LPLA molecule, if you were to predict what it does, you'd say, well, it's involved in wound healing. And what was really, really exciting to me was that 30 years earlier in the Nature Journal, there had been an article by Michael Brown and Joe Goldstein, who won the Nobel Prize in 1985 for working out the LDL uh, uptake pathway. And they'd written this article about plasma lipoproteins. And there was quite a section on LPA. And the big uh, question was, well, why do we have LPA and what's its function? And this is what they predicted. They predicted that having a form of cholesterol that binds to fibrinogen might be of selective advantage for wound healing. So it was really exciting for me to see that 30 years later, we had, using very high-end technologies, um, identified the proteins on our pilet, and when we put them all together, our prediction would be exactly that of Brown and Goldstein. And that was quite exciting for me to find that. So the proteomic study uh, has given us in, an insight into function. We obviously have to do a lot of, a lot of experience, experiments now to prove that LPLA is actually involved in wound healing. But knowing the protein makeup of LPLA has given us a lot of information that we can now do further work on 
in studying these proteins. And Torsten, for example, and Anna are looking at the levels of these proteins in people that had heart disease versus people that don't have heart disease. So there's a lot of, um, this, this study has given us a lot of information to, to, to lead us into further experiments. So the last question, how is alpha taken up by cells? This is work by Monica Sharma, who is a PhD student, uh, still currently with me. Um, and Monica set up a system with uh, cultured liver cells, so these are liver cells cultured, um, and took purified alpha little a and incubated the liver cells with the alpha little a, gave them a good wash, and then looked to see where the alpha little a ended up inside the cell. And we did this by visualising the LP little a inside the cell using confocal microscopy, which is a technique which basically cuts through a cell. It cuts through sections of a cell. A bit like having an MRI where they cut through, slice through your body, um, where we were slicing through a cell and we were looking to see where the LP little a was. And this is one of the first experiments that Monica did. And we have a whole range of markers that light up different parts of the cell. In this case, we used a marker that lights up the cell nucleus. So we can see, see where the nucleus is. And we can visualise down the microscope and see LPLA coming into the cells. Our LPLA molecule is stained green. And you can see it coming into the cell and accumulating at two hours, and then the signal fading with time. What we can also do is crack open these cells and look at the cell contents and actually probe for the APOA protein, which tags LP little a, and this is shown down here. The LP a, APOA band tagging the LP a is apparent after one hour of incubation and accumulated uh, to two hours, so pretty much showing what we were seeing in the, uh, down the microscope, and this can be quantified. So Monica had set up a, a system to look at LP a being taken up into cells. The next question was, well, what receptor is, is responsible for taking LPLA into cells? We knew it would be a receptor-mediated uptake of LPLA, and we had plenty of receptors to choose from. These are all receptors that have been uh, reported as interacting with LPLA, uh, and we chose these three here, the LDL receptor, the acyloglycoprotein receptor, <coughs> and one of the plasminogen receptors, because we thought these were the most likely receptors to be involved. They were expressed by liver cells, and there had been reports that they interacted with alpha little a. So we reasoned that if any of these three receptors were responsible for taking alpha a into cells, that we would find them together with the alpha a inside the cell. And so, again, looking down the confocal microscope, we had a stain specifically for the acyloglycoprotein receptor. We had one also for the LDL receptor and one for the plasminogen receptor that we chose to work with. And here is our LPLA stained green. So red plus green equals yellow, primary colours, you'll remember that from primary school. And what we were looking for was yellow. We were looking to see if these two things were co-localised the alpha and the receptor. And when you merge these two images together, you look for yellow. We didn't see much, and this is the uh, blown up again here, the merged image blown up. No, yet not much yellow here, not much yellow here, but down here you can see quite a bit of yellow. And that, what that was telling us was that it looks like alpha is co-localised, is found with this particular receptor inside the cell but we had to prove this further. So we were fortunate to be able to get hold of some cells that were missing the plasminogen receptor. They had had this receptor knocked out. And we looked to see how well these knockout cells took up LP little a. So here's our cells um, without any LP little a added. And we were looking, we were tagging the APOA to see it coming into the cells. And this is incubated with LP little a. Now, the wild type, or WT, that just stands for normal cells. They are normal cells with the receptor there, present, and you can see them taking up the alpha a. But when we used the cells where this plasminogen receptor had been knocked out, 
we found that, in fact, there was much less uptake of alkyl A, and this is quantified over here. Now, we were quite excited about this because no one had shown that this receptor was involved in uh, lipoproteinyl A uptake. And you can see there's still a little bit of alkyl A uptake still here, and Monica is, still, uh, is currently looking at two other um, plasminogen receptors. The plasminogen receptor family is quite large, but there's a couple of other receptors that we think might be involved in this residual uptake. But then we wanted to know, well, where does the alkyl A end up? Once it gets inside the cell, where does it go? And there's lots of places inside the cell that things can go when they get taken up. We were expecting to find the alkyl A in a vesicle structure known as the early endosome because most things that get taken up by receptors end up in early endosomes when they first come into the cell. We thought the alkyl A could end up in lysosomes, which are basically bags of enzymes that break things down. So we thought maybe we might find the alkyl A in lysosomes. Another place we could find the alkyl A is in the uh, an organelle called the Golgi apparatus, or the Golgi. And this is just like a big processing plant inside the cell. It modifies things and sorts things and usually sends them packing uh, into secrete, secretory vesicles that actually uh, re-secrete re -secrete things back out from the cells. So using the same techniques as I've just shown you, we had a whole lot of markers that stained all these different parts of the cell. And what we saw when we did our staining technique is we found that the alkyl A was actually co-localised with early endosomes. This is a marker for early endosomes. And if you can look over here, you'll see quite a bit of yellow. So, and we expected, we expected to find the alkyl A in early endosomes. And then we looked to see if it was in lysosomes. So we had a lysosome marker here. And again, using the same technique. We saw no yellow at all, and we decided, well, they were not being broken down by lysosomes, which is a wee bit of a surprise to us, because LDL gets broken down in lysosomes. So then we took a look at the Golgi to see if we could find alkyl A in the Golgi. And in fact, within a couple of hours, we got very good co-localisation of alkyl A in the Golgi. And we wondered what it was doing there because the Golgi uh, often repackages things and sends them out in secretory vesicles for things to be re-secreted outside the cell. And we'd never heard of APOA or ALPLA being re-secreted. This was a novel finding. We did one further co-localisation experiment, and this was tagging the vesicles known as recycling endosomes, which are the vesicles involved in re-secreting things back outside the cell. And what we found was very good co-localisation, indicating that alkyl A was, looks, looked like it was being uh, packaged into re-secretory vesicles. We also had another marker that also tags recycling endosomes called transferrin, which is a protein that recycles iron. And we found alkyl A in the same location as transferrin. So this was really confirming that alkyl A was being packaged for re-secretion. And the very last question that we had to ask was, well, is LPLA actually being resecreted outside of the cell? So Monica modified her experiments slightly. And instead of looking at the cells at this point, she lay, left them in fresh media and then took the media to see if we could find LPLA out, outside the cells in the media. And what she found was that within two hours, we actually saw the APOA coming out of the cells, but it wasn't fully formed alkyl A, it was just the APOA protein part. And that was quite a surprise to us. And what she further found was with time, it looked like the APOA reformed alkyl A outside the cell. And that wasn't a surprise to us because we knew that these cells made LDL-like particles and we knew that if you put APOA into media that contains LDL particles, it would actually form alkyl A. And that was what we were seeing. So summarising all of this work uh, in this diagram, we had found that alkyl A gets taken up by the plasminogen receptor, comes in on early endosomes. At some point, the APOA part is broken away 
from the particle. Now we don't know exactly where that happens, but there is evidence for uh, the disulfide links that are between proteins being reduced in some of these compartments, either the early endosomes, the Golgi, or the recycling endosomes. What we do know is that the APOA part traffics through into recycling endosomes and is spat back out by the cell. And once outside the cell, it reforms LPAA. And Monica has shown that the LDL part actually does go to the lysosome by <coughs> labelling the lipid component. So we had basically uncovered the whole catabolic pathway for LPAA. And this um, has just recently resulted in Monica winning a number of awards. She's just arrived back from the States, actually. Where, is, where are you, Monica? There you go. Uh, where she uh, presented this work at three different conferences, two in Austria and one in the US. And for every presentation, she was awarded a Best Presentation Award. And I think that's a huge... Um, a hugely successful um, PhD. <laughs> so that's um, where we are, and we're just about to submit this work. So this is very, very recent work, and we're just about to submit for publishing. Now, I just want to finish up by talking a little bit, just a little bit, about the HDL research program that we've had going. HDL uh, was discovered in 1929. It is the complete opposite of LPLA in terms of heart disease. It is protective against heart disease. And we know this from many large clinical trials that show low levels of HDL are a, are a risk factor for heart disease, so completely opposite um, situation. We know from transgenic animal studies that if you make animals express high levels of HDL, they are protected against developing heart disease. And we know that HDL has a lot of um, protective properties. There is a condition known as Tangier disease where individuals virtually don't have any HDL and they develop early heart disease. Now, if you just focus on the left part of this slide, I just want to mention one key protein that's really, really important for HDL being formed. And that is a protein known as the ABCA1 cholesterol transporter. HDL starts life as a very lipid poor particle, it gets secreted from the liver cell with only a little bit of protein, and the protein on HDL is a, a, a protein called APOA1, and it doesn't have any cholesterol on it at all. It actually picks up cholesterol in circulation by the action of this transporter here, the ABCA1 cholesterol transporter, which sits on the membranes of all our cells. It's very highly expressed by the liver, and this protein basically puts cholesterol onto HDL. Without the activity of this protein, you cannot make HDL. And so just one slide about my HDL research program. And this was performed by two uh, very hardworking and clever PhD students, Bree Sorensen and Rachel Satani. We had identified a number of uh, people in the local population that had really, really low HDL cholesterol levels. This is, it was in conjunction with uh, Greg Jones and Michael Williams. And we'd found individuals that had really low HDL levels. And when we looked at their ABCA1 transported gene, and this is an artist, artistic a, a, um, impression of what ABCA1 might look like in the membrane, we found that these people had lots of, had mutations. They had mutations in their ABCA1 gene and, the, and therefore their protein, and they were all over the protein. And what Rachel and Bree did was they looked to see, they investigated these mutants to see why they were causing low um, HDL cholesterol levels in these people. And so we expressed all of these, well, Bree expressed all of these mutants in cells, and this is a green uh, labeled ABCA1 protein. And this is the normal protein, and this is a stain for the outside of the cell. And you can see if you do the co-localization, the protein is found on the outside of cells. And this is one of our mutants. What we actually found was almost all of these mutants aggregated inside the cell. They never made it to the outside of the cell. And that would be what, and that is why they were causing these people to have low HDL cholesterol. So now the grand finale. So all of these years, these two programs have been going on independently, side by side, 
We never thought there was a connection between LPLA and HDL. But a few years ago, we were studying um, some mice. These were LPLA transgenic mice that we were working with. And we found that they had high HDL levels, much higher than their, their non-transgenic litter mates. And so we, we wondered why LPLA was causing these animals to have high HDL. And at the same time, there were a couple of studies um, done in some African populations that showed there was a positive correlation between LPLA and HDL. And we wondered why this was. But we knew we had the perfect system to actually look at this. So the system that Monica had set up, whereby we took liver cells and incubated them with LPLA, we then used to answer the question whether there was a connection between LPLA and HDL. And what we did was we took our cells, incubated them with LPLA, and instead of looking at LPLA uptake, we looked to see if LPLA could affect the activity and the expression of ABCA1, because ABCA1 is the key protein involved in HDL formation. And so what Monica saw was that with increasing amounts of LPLA, we got increased expression of the ABCA1 gene, and that translated into increased levels of the protein inside the cells. And furthermore, these cells showed that had been incubated with LPLA showed increased cholesterol efflux, which is the function of the ABCA1 protein. This got us quite excited because we thought, wow, there's a connection. LPLA is upregulating HDL formation. And what was really interesting was that there'd been a number of papers published showing that the APOA part of the LPLA protein actually bound oxidised phospholipids. So these are just oxidised forms of lipids. And furthermore, it was known that oxidised phospholipids upregulate ABCA1. That was well documented in the literature. And it did so by the activity of these two transcription factors here, PPAR and LXR. These two transcription factors are upregulated by oxidised lipids, and they both upregulate ABCA1. And so the last bit in the puzzle to solve was, well, what receptor is involved in taking up oxidised lipids from the LPLA particle? And we knew there was only one receptor that could do that. And that was this receptor here, the SRB1 receptor, which had been well published as taking up oxidised lipids from lipoproteins. It didn't take the whole particle up, only the oxidised lipids. And so we thought, right, let's see if this receptor is involved in the ABCA1 response. We had an antibody that blocked the SRB1 receptor. And when we put that antibody onto our cells, we saw that we completely blocked the ABCA1 response that was promoted by LPLA. So here we have our LPLA response, and then we can block that with the SRB1 receptor. Furthermore, we showed that blocking whole LPLA particle uptake, so the pathway that I've just been telling you about previously, had no effect. So we had specifically showed that it was the oxidised phospholipids, which we knew were carried on the LPLA particle, were the, the key thing that was promoting this ABCA1 response. So bringing it all together in a diagram, here we had shown that alpha-little-A binds to the SRB1 receptor. And fortunately for us, there was a group in the US that had literally just published that the SRB1 receptor binds to alpha-little-A. And just the oxidised lipids that are found on the alpha-little-A particle are brought through by the, or transferred by the SRB1 receptor into the cell where they activate these two transcription factors which are known to activate the ABCA1 gene. And that leads to greater expression and more ABCA1 protein on the plasma membrane, and that results in greater efflux and higher HDL cholesterol levels. And what was really exciting was about two months ago, there was a paper published, it was actually just an abstract, not a full paper, it was published in the Journal uh, of American Cardiology, uh, College of Cardiologists, and it was a study using a database of a million people where they'd measured the LPLA levels and they'd measured the HDL levels, and they reported a positive correlation between LPLA and HDL, and we think 
that we have found why there's a, there's a connection because of this pathway. So, this resulted in a really nice publication for Monica in the Journal of Lipid Research last year, and in fact, this article was chosen for commentary in that issue, and, uh, and that's a, a, a really exciting thing to have your paper chosen uh, out of a bunch of papers to be commented on. So I think I've um, well wowed you with enough science tonight, um, but I want to just finish up by acknowledging many, many people. And so I've, throughout my talk, I've used we, it's the royal we, because basically all of this work has been done by my students. And I'm very, very fortunate that I've had many, many hardworking, really smart PhD students. Um, and there's too many to mention. I've just listed the ones whose work I've presented tonight. I've also been blessed with having many, many good collaborators. And I've listed a few that have been important to me here. Greg Jones, Michael Williams, Torf Sutton and Anna for the proteomics work, Gregory Redpath, who's helped Monica with her studies, and Matthew Paragini, who helped us with the early work on the peptides. And I've also been blessed to have two very um, fantastic research fellows helping out with this research, and Emma Cheeseman, who was my very first research fellow, and Carolyn Porteous, who is in the audience tonight. And last but not least, I want to also uh, give my thanks to a number of general staff in the biochemistry department. They're too numerous to mention, but these are the ones that are busy working away in the background, sorting the finances, sorting the administration. There's a couple of people I just want to mention. as Bronwyn, um, sorry, Bronwyn Carlisle, who actually helped me get my slides pretty for tonight. So thank you, Bronwyn. Um, and, and also Murray Cockrell, who is our key equipments person who is always fixing equipment, and if without him, my research program would have never um, been. So thank you to Murray, I know he's not here tonight. And last but not least, I have been fortunate to have been um, supported by all of my past HODs. So Merv Smith, and I can see Merv tonight. Warren Tate, he's also in the audience tonight. John Cutfield, and more recently, Kurt Krauss. They have given me a lot of support over the years. And also, thank you to Catherine for trusting me to be her deputy. <laughs> so. Thank you, Sally, for um, I think what everyone will agree is a fabulous sort of tour through her scientific career. I just really want to make a few comments um, before I know I'm in the way of um, us and uh, I think more celebration. But I think Sally is, um, has really taken us on a tour today, um, starting in, I think, Selwyn and then going to Lincoln and then on to the USA and then back to Dunedin. And I think the one thing that is common through all of her scientific life is her lipids and her interest in, uh, I guess, understanding the lipoprotein component and their roles in health and disease. And I think, to me, it's marvellous that there's this connection right from her uh, PhD right the way through. And I think it's a, uh, I think she's, she, I, I dare her to work on something else, I guess. So um, <laughs> I think, but I think it's been very fruitful and so a very productive um, research career uh, and that we hope will go on to continued success. And I think the, um, Sally has really shown us how applying a range of different techniques to this problem has really borne considerable fruit. And I think that's something we should all remember in our research, not just to be stuck on one approach, um, but it's really about, she's used it, uh, I know she didn't talk about it, but genetic approach, then a proteomics, and then really the careful biochemical dissection of these molecules, and has been really very revealing, and I think allowed her to make considerable insights. So I think that's a key thing about what Sally has done. I think the other thing that we saw tonight very clearly was the ability to build connections between different aspects of her research, and I think that that's really what can lift 
sometimes is to be prepared for the unexpected and not sort of have a fixated view about how things were. And so for these significant advances, we need to be prepared for the unexpected. And I think Sally has shown that tonight very clearly, how different aspects have connected, and she's really capitalised on that. So uh, I think, thank you, Sally, for a, a great tour of your research. And just a couple of things, even though I know I'm supposed just to talk about research, but I really just wanted to comment that I think Sally really embodies what we think of as an academic. Uh, with all of um, her, uh, especially her teaching contributions, which I really think are significant. And she's made uh, a huge contribution to the department, and particularly ensuring that the next generation of biochemists are very well trained and prepared to go on and embark on research careers. Sally is an outstanding uh, a teacher and ambassador for the department. And I think you can see tonight also that she really has engaged with her students, and they have really been the backbone of her uh, productive team. So I think that's a great uh, credit to Sally and all of the uh, students that have worked with her. And so really, just really uh, a couple of other comments is firstly to thank, um, I think Merv Smith we should owe a thanks because he had the wisdom to uh, offer Sally a position back in 1995 and 1996. And today I was uh, looking through the old records and uh, seeing what was said and I think that Sally was actually very brave to come. I think there was some <laughs> considerable, <laughs> when I was looking at the correspondence, first there was warnings and some discussion that they were very sceptical about the promotion process at the time, and so that was a, a slightly a blunt response to an inquiry. And then this, uh, I think today at least we can be sure that the promotion process has worked well. And then there was also a letter from the then Vice Chancellor Graham Fogelberg, and I think um, I won't. I was going to read some quotes from it, but I, I won't do that. But I think that he was really expecting great things of Sally, and it said that she had to be better than anyone in the northern universities of New Zealand. And so, <laughs> um, I, that, that, that to be successful, she would really have to excel. And it was quite, uh, it's quite strong comments. And I think. Um, Sally has done well and has clearly excelled and came here bravely into, I think, um, a time when it was a reasonably tough time. So well done, Sally. I think you have, um, well, you have shared with us a great insight tonight and um, I really want to thank, give Sally my personal thanks as the Deputy HOD. She uh, can be relied upon always for an honest opinion and also to muck in when's needed so that she will come and help if need be and uh, is very willing to share her load in the department. So uh, I think a great colleague to have in the department. So thank you, Sally. So uh, come over because I don't want to get in the way of the celebrations. My name is Peter Crampton, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences, and it's my pleasure to bring our formalities this evening to a close. I would like to say thank you to Sally for that consummate performance, and also to add my thanks to her um, for her very evident commitment to excellence in all her activities, and that's come through very strongly, hasn't it? And also thanks to her team and her postgraduate students who are here this evening. Thank you to all of you. Look, in closing, and before I invite us all to refreshments, I would like to say a final thank you to uh, Sally's family who've come this evening to support her. I think you constitute about half the audience this <laughs> evening. <laughs> thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you followed um, the, the gist of her story. So, look, thank you to everybody else, Sally's uh, colleagues and uh, supporters and to members of the public who've been here this evening. Thank you to all of you. So, look, that's the end this evening, and I invite everybody to join us for refreshments uh, upstairs in the staff club, which is just around the corner. Go past all the, the works on, the, the, the beautification works, find your way past there, and go into the staff club and go upstairs. Thank you very much for coming this evening.